All right, so we just finished talking about um, aqueducts and surface water. Um, I wanted to show you an image of two aquifers that are found in uh, north central Texas. So if you look at the image right here. So this is uh, the DFW area is pretty much right in the middle of this. So we have the Woodbine Aquifer and the Trinity Aquifer. So that's going to be named after the Trinity River, which is here. Um, so these are two aquifers that overlap. Okay. Um, they are going to be used for agriculture and then uh, for drinking water here in, uh, in this part of Texas. Now, one of the issues that we're seeing with these two aquifers is that the, um, the water quality is diminishing and the water level is also decreasing. So we're basically using this faster than it's able to recharge. So if we don't um, find ways to conserve the usage of the water, then this will be completely tapped out. So studies show that water levels are decreasing. As well as the water quality. Okay, well, that's not how you spell it. Quality. Oh, that is so bad, y'all. Quality. There we go. So, the big take home message for this is we have to allow it to recharge. Okay, now. Um, in the last video, I mentioned that when we are drilling wells to these um, aquifers underground, that um, we have to be very careful of how much water we're taking out at one time. So the water table, it pretty much needs to be kept constant because as you can see, the land is basically sitting on top of the water table. Okay, so this needs to be constant, meaning we've got to let it recharge. Okay, if we don't, if we are using it faster than it's able to recharge, it produces what's called a cone of depression. So as you can see, the ground is actually sinking into the aquifer itself. And so when this happens, we no longer have groundwater that is reachable or consumable by humans. So no longer um, any groundwater. This also is another reason why we see, um, this is one cause of sinkholes because the ground right here is very unstable. Okay. Now, when we are talking about aquifers and they're next to an ocean, we have the potential for the mixture or the contamination uh, with salt water. Okay, so these are going to be near coastal areas. Okay, um, so when the water um, is allowed or the uh, aquifer is allowed to recharge at normal rates, there is a separation between the fresh water and the salt water. So if you look right here, we see this very fine separation between the two. So this is when um, normal recharge occurs. Okay, now if you look right here, what's happened? You see the salt water intruding into the fresh water. So this is when normal recharge is slow. And you'll know that if salt water is able to contaminate fresh water, it is not usable for agriculture or for human consumption. Okay. All right. So we just talked about underground water. Let's focus on surface water. So we're going to be looking at lakes and rivers here. So, um, 
remember that it was close to 3% of the water on the planet is fresh water. So 1% um, of that is surface water. So 1% of fresh water is surface water. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's look at lakes. So this is looking at what we call lake productivity. Remember, productivity is a reference to photosynthesis. Now, if you look at this one, guys, we talked about this one last semester. Why is it covered in algae? Why is it green? Obviously, we've had eutrophication happen here. So this has been contaminated with fertilizer. And it's caused that massive algal bloom. Okay, so this is a eutrophic lake. So we have um, very high levels of productivity here because it's covered in algae. So we have high levels of productivity due to runoff of fertilizers. Okay, now. If we're to compare that to this lake, so this lake looks like pristine, it's crystal clear water, it's clean. This is what we call oligotrophic. Okay, oligotrophic means it's typically going to be a newer body of water. It's a newer lake and it has a low amount of nutrients. It hasn't been uh, around long enough in order for sedimentation uh, to build up, okay? Now, when we look at surface water, there are two main issues that come with it. So we can look at both um, extremes. So we have floods versus droughts. So um, floods, obviously right here, it says is an event in which the volume of water and the flood crest is much above average, okay? So there is too much rain happening. Now, why is this a problem in industrialized areas, in large cities? What are we covered mostly with? Concrete, okay? We know that concrete is not porous, it does not absorb water, so it basically sits there and becomes stagnant or it has to run off somewhere, okay? Now, what causes this amount of water to build up. When we are um, putting down concrete, what do we have to do in order to put the concrete down? We have to cut down trees. Forests are very good water sinks. They absorb tons of water. And so when we have deforestation, it causes increased amounts of flooding. So a flood is when we have too much precipitation, it's going to be caused by deforestation, okay? Um, also the destruction of wetlands, because wetlands are meant to be those um, protectors of, of the mainland. So destruction of wetlands, okay? And again, right here with the concrete, we have impermeable surfaces. Okay, now the other end of the spectrum is a drought. So a drought is a series of years in which rainfall is significantly below average. So um, when you don't have enough water, it's going to lead to soil erosion. Um, and erosion, remember, is also caused by um, deforestation because soil isn't able to move around if there are trees planted. So um, this leads to soil erosion. and expanding deserts. We do not want another dust bowl. If you overuse the land, um, obviously it can lead to desertification of that plot of land, uh, but also lack of rainfall. Now, both of these guys, and I know we haven't talked about climate change yet, that's actually our next unit. Um, both of these are impacted by climate change. Flooding and droughts um, are both impacted by climate change. Okay, so 
when we have um, water on the surface and we need to control the movement of it, there are different um, ways that are different structures that can be built to help uh, control the movement. Um, it basically depends on the terrain of the ground itself. So this first picture right here, this is what we call a levee. Okay, a levee is basically a bank that is built on each side of a river. And this is to prevent flooding. Now, it could also be put on lakes as well. Um, back in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans, it was the levee system on Lake Pontchartrain that failed. Um, and so the, uh, the levees themselves were the, were the ones that actually collapsed. And that's what caused the massive flooding of New Orleans. It wasn't the hurricane itself. It was the failure of the levee system on Lake Pontchartrain. Okay. Um, so this is on rivers. Okay. So we can have the exact same thing happen uh, on a coastal region. So if you look right here, how the land curves up like this, this is called a dike. Okay. And this is to prevent ocean water from flooding. Okay, so levees, freshwater, dikes, saltwater. Now, we have dams. We talked about dams uh, last unit with hydroelectricity. Okay, dams can uh, control the flow of water. And then this right here, I just, I've always thought these things were super silly. They're super cute. This is what we call a fish ladder. So when we are diverting the flow of water or changing the flow of water, we also are impacting um, fish migration, essentially. So we still need wildlife, fish specifically, to be able to get to different locations because typically they like to spawn in a certain location every year. Um, so in order to help that, fish ladders can be built um, to help fish migrate. All right, so um, in the next video, we're gonna finish up this first part of the unit and I'm going to talk specifically about the Aral Sea.